which are very very important particularly in current days and uh, how these climate exchanges they uh, they, they are uh, impacting our life or our animals life and how the zoonotic or uh, you know reverse zoonosis they are happening so this is basically i wanted to cover because uh, the uh, environment has been my passion even though uh, being the medical doctor i i can't do much but definitely this is uh, i want to uh, at least uh, share my views or uh, share my concerns about the climatic changes so obviously in the climatic changes whenever we talk uh, there are two uh, most important factors one is obviously uh, global warming and the uh, second is oscillation sudden oscillation i will come to explain what is oscillation and uh, basically you can understand that it is a uh, oscillation means the uh, uh, the uh, the monsoon and that kind of uh, the rainfall or the, what we call the precipitation so these two things they are making lot of difference and both are equally important you can't say that warming is more important or the oscillation is uh, less important so if uh, we can see that if we continue to uh, do like that uh, that if nothing uh, special is uh, done as of now uh, here you can see in this uh, graph this graph that uh, by uh, end of uh, this century we will have more than 4 degree temperature rise and you can imagine that 4 degree temperature rise means a huge disaster the another possibility is that you know we we do uh, some of the uh, uh, things and then we can have uh, uh, i am sorry uh, this is uh, so i have to do and then so if we can do something like uh, some of the measures if we take uh, that is called uh, s750 and then s550 so 550 is energy six level things and then obviously it will be much much better but even then the temperature rise will be there but if only partially we we mitigate the uh, climatic uh, changes then obviously it will be better but definitely not that better so still we will have about uh, more than 3.5 uh, degree celsius temperature by end of this century now this is also very very important that you know the overwhelmed you know population animal and everything is so all of us whether it is animal or humans both be exhale uh, the carbon dioxide so that is really really very important and this is making huge difference and if you imagine that you know uh, the atmosphere is almost saturating with, with the carbon dioxide so this is very very crucial and obviously we also need to look into that how the carbon dioxide which is obviously uh, inversely impacting our life how we can take care of that so if we see the 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 change in the surface temperature and its consequences what will happen if you remember in the very first slide i said that one is precipitation that is oscillation which is result of the oscillation and the other is temperature so here on the left side if you see the surface temperature if you see it, it will be like that in the most of the uh, countries but here you can see that arctic which we all know that you know this is maximum uh, maximally impacted and here this is a precipitation so for the arctic both the things the precipitation is also uh, unfavorable because that also arctic present because when the water is there the ice or the snow is you know you know that it melts down so that is also not very good so for arctic both the temperature as well as the precipitation they are very very important and therefore the climatic changes will impact maximally in the arctic and if the arctic is obviously you know the the the, the temperature is changed or the uh, the arctic is dissolved then whole world will be impacted indirectly or directly and here if you see that why very soon it is not end of the century in next you know, 30 years or so the changes in the annual uh, temperature they are expected that in india is also here you can see the whole world is going to be very very warm and this is very very alarming so therefore i think that we many a times what happens that we scientist we are if i am a medical doctor or you are a veterinary doctor we always concentrate on our specific area but we forget that who will uh, care for the environment 
So uh, uh, my daughter also very actively works on that, and I uh, whenever I get chance, I I emphasize that irrespective of what your specific area is, we all must work on the environment because our future generations, humans as as well as the flora and fauna, both will be impacted very very seriously, and therefore we must also learn teach both. So because many of our teachers they don't know they are very very you know least aware about the environmental changes and obviously because they are not aware uh, our teachers also they cannot teach to their students so i think this is very very crucial and i will show you how directly it it is impacting now another issue is other than temperature because migration and urbanization that is also leading to we all know that you know you are in you know, a uh, south southern part of the country we are in the northern part of the country irrespective whether you are in north south or west the vehicles number of vehicles and industrial emissions they have gone un you know parallel and this is not only in india but globally it is happening the number of vehicles number of air conditions number of deep freezers which are emit, emit, emitting the uh, carbon dioxide and carbon oxide so these all are they are making really really very serious concern for all of all of us then obviously the because of this industrialization this is also leading to unclean air and that is impacting our health directly and indirectly the our heart is not healthy our lungs are not healthy so all these things they are happening and therefore it is very very important that we should also be concerned equally as we are concerned about our own specialty so we were talking about the temperature and carbon di carbon dioxide how they are impacting now coming to the the precipitation leads to how it it is generated i am sure that some of you might have uh, read somewhere uh, la nina and el nino el nino is very common most of you might have uh, read or might have heard somewhere but uh, not many of us are aware of these words so el nino and la nina they are just opposite of each other and what happens that usually the global warming leads to more precipitation and this precipitation is not organized so this is sometimes happens you know unorganized way and that that leads to devastations many devastations and i will show you that how it happens that there is a principle of the walker circulation which is a neutral usually our water in the our oceans should remain you know uh, 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 you know stagnant or it should have very minimal movement but sometimes what happens that you know i am sure that jwar wata and all these things you might have heard but you know they they are active too much and too much means that is really leads to many of the disasters and that happens because of the uh, warmth or temperature is very high and sometimes that leads to low pressure so normally what happens i will show you that normally this is el nino how it happens that from the our south side to further south side so from the indonesia say for example here what will happen that if the usually in america it will happen the the, the pressure is low and so what will happen the hot or the warm water will go from the indonesian side to whole world so it will circulate and this is known as the el nino and then what happens in america most of these el nino they result into the you know disastrous uh, you know uh, rainfall and you know uh, consequences the uh, la nina is just opposite of that as i said so here what happens that here the pressure is low in the our side means like indonesia singapore and like that and then this becomes la nino so the water opposite direction the water starts moving the warm water comes from that side too and that obviously leads to very very hurricane type of things or you know uh, various kind of you know the uh, recently we had in india also so this is la nina and this this, this uh, you know odisha and west bengal and some of the your uh, state also they, they they had a disaster so these all lead to uh, various kinds of the temperature changes now they also affect not only the the, the precipitation happens but this the temperature is so much and the precipitation is too much they can also lead to uh, effect on the uh, our fauna and flora now the uh, what will happen say for example if we don't do anything so the pacific what will have it will have much warmth 
it will be dry and it will have severe intense rainfalls and obviously we will have you know intense storms and sea level will rise about 20 centimeter 20 centimeter you can imagine 20 centimeter you are from the uh, kerala and you know tamil nadu so you can imagine 20 centimeter rise what will happen in the whole of the chennai will be submerged now so, so climate they, they have the impact on the human health also directly as well as indirectly and here you can see the thermal extremes obviously what we have the sunburn and other things and then the flooding and then the storms indirect also we have the bacterial diseases the other infections food shortages worsening of the pollution uh, population and social disruption now if we see that climatic changes, they obviously there are too many possibilities that you know either you adapt to it or obviously because sometimes human society is like that. We have been adopting and we have adapted to many of the situations, but sometimes we may not be able to adapt to the circumstances they arise. And then what what will happen that obviously pathogens and transmission they will alter what normally we have been adjusted to. These you know balance will you know get disturbed. And therefore, the pathogens transmission, they will, you know, make a lot of difference. So in that form, the more of the infectious diseases as well as other diseases, they can happen. And these diseases could be vector-borne, the water-borne, the food-borne also, or air-borne. As I said, the pollution, the flooding, and the, uh, the uh, unclean water supply. So they can have, you know, climatic changes. They can have the both the the zoonosis as well as anthroponosis. In both the situations, these climatic changes they can make difference. So obviously, the direct, you know, this is like that, and indirect, this is this. But in zoonosis also, they will make lot of difference temperatures. So the what will happen that infection through wild animals they can happen due to climatic changes. Animals can come into contact of the humans. Also. Deforestation brings human in contact with the wild animals. That is another possibility. In some countries, exotic meats they have become uh, very trendy, and that is leading to zoonosis. And the recent example for this is that corona uh, infection. So the corona, you know, they, these viruses are they are not new. The common cold and like you know there are more than uh, thirty nine viruses which belong to the corona viridae family. But what happened that you know. The, they, they are usually most of the coronaviruses they are from the animal origin but some of these are very mild in nature but the most important three viruses which are belonging to this family they were uh, from the uh, this family and here they can transmit from the various animals to humans i will give you some of the examples here they are divided there are almost 39 uh, members of the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus family. So these are the 39 viruses, and they they are divided into alpha, beta, gamma, delta, four subfamilies or groups. And here you see that they are all coronaviruses here, and they are most of these are from the animals. So the natural host of most of these coronaviruses they are you know animal uh, you know uh, animals. But importantly, what happened that recently these beta coronavi coronaviruses, the SARS and MERS, they came, you know, in 2000, early 2004 and 5, and then 2011. And this new virus, which emerged from the SARS coronavirus, that is known as uh, 2019 novel coronaviruses. Now, it obviously, uh, I'm sure that you must be knowing that new name is SARS COVID uh, coronavirus 2. So that has become now. Why it has happened? Why I am correlating with the environment and the, uh, the 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 exotic foods in China? If you see, they eat everything. They can eat everything here. You can see the markets. The, 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 even the you know you can see the, these are the bats. So they they eat bats. They eat dogs. They eat everything. So if you see the markets, you know uh, even many of the Indians, if they go once, they will not uh, they will forget about uh, non veg. So the, the situation in the China is really, really terrible. And this kind of market was the uh, so-called source from where the first coronavirus emerged. And therefore, it has become very important that we should be equally considerate to our specific uh, area of expert, expertise 
that is our specialty what we are trained for but we should also be equally considerate to our uh, you know uh, common habitat and our climatic changes so there are many other other than you know these uh, you know uh, uh, viruses i said which are usually food borne or from animals they come and they are through meat but there are many other viruses and parasitic infections they come through the vectors and the common examples are malaria dengue african trypanosomiasis leishmaniasis leishmaniasis chagas disease the topic is so i am rushing you know if uh, i i welcome anybody if they have the question i will definitely explain later on but i am going little faster because you know i wanted to emphasize on some of the diseases and then obviously they are, they can be through mosquito they can be through the uh, sand flies like sand flies leishmania and sand fly fever then mosquito aedes anopheles culex all the three species of the mosquito they can transmit various kinds of infections they can be through ticks also they can be uh, triatoms also cc fly they can be other fleas also black flies and then aquatic snails also they can you know uh, transmit and similarly the lice also can transmit now the typical examples which commonly we have in uh, 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 entire india they are the uh, dengue and chikungunya so if you see the you know the pattern and why i am saying that baseline transmission if you see in 1961 to 1990 it was here like that so you, here you can see only southern parts of the the, the, the coastal areas of uh, the india they were uh, you know uh, affected of course the indonesia singapore cambodia they all are infected but now if you see here if the previous slide if you see here and this slide if you see because of climatic changes it is expected that whole country whole india will be infected in next 30 years so dengue is not going to obviously vanish but that will remain and that might become little more you know prevalent and more riskier the another vector borne disease is leishmaniasis which i will explain a little more and i will finally i will show you that how it uh, correlates with the changes in the uh, environment or uh, uh, the climate so this is worldwide but most importantly in old world about 67 countries are affected as a whole in uh, it is prevalent in 88 countries most importantly this is india bangladesh brazil nepal sudan both uh, the new sudan and old sudan they are uh, affected so uh, then the 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 vector of the uh, leishmaniasis is uh, you know very tiny sand fly which is smaller than mosquito and there are about 180 species but obviously only 30 can feed on humans so here this is the distribution of bizarre leishmaniasis it is happens here in india entire india is endemic for that and then you can see the africa and then america but here now this is the cutaneous leishmaniasis another form of leishmaniasis both are zoonotic in nature and then obviously the temperature can make lot of difference the sand fly the fauna uh, will change and the more and more sand fly they will uh, be there and obviously if there is a more number of sand fly more number of the uh, kalajar cases of leishmaniasis will be there the environment has played very important significant role if some of you might be remembering uh, that you know the first case of uh, leishmaniasis or bizarre leishmaniasis was identified in chennai and one in uh, west bengal uh, now bangladesh of course and 1903 but now if you see that it has started dis disappeared from the chennai area it disappeared but it migrated from assam to here and then it is ganges valley it is uh, you know uh, migrating and now it has reached here from here it started and then it is migrating up to it has reached up to uh, hill area uttarakhand i'm sure that most of you know that it is a you know foot step uh, foot uh, hill of the uh, everest uh, our himalaya and then you can imagine that you know which started in the both the cities which are very hot and humid now it has reached to the 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 very cold area so you can imagine that leishmania and the sand fly both have adapted to the temperature which was not reported earlier in these areas now these sand flies and the parasite both have adapted to so like humans they are also adapting to that now in not only in india it happens it is happening globally so if you see the south america in 2001 it was the situation of leishmania was like that and but now if you see 2011 it was like that 
So the things are definitely changing everywhere. The another parasite I would like to give a few examples. And uh, one of the example is toxoplasma. This is also having direct uh, correlation with the climatic or environmental changes. This is a very, you know, uh, uh, small parasite. Which, uh, uh, I know Dr. Anandan and Dr. Uh, Daveda, they started uh, developing interest in the toxoplasma and that has been my passion. So this is, a, you know, uh, uh, the coccidian protozoan parasite, which usually it is a zoonotic disease. And humans are also affected in many various ways. And usually it is a foodborne infection, but uh, sometimes it can be through other sources, like mother to child or through food also. So food, if, you know, again, as I said, in the China story, coronavirus, here also, if your food is not cooked well, and like in China, most of these, uh, they eat semi-cooked or, you know, half-cooked. So if the food is not cooked, not only coronavirus, many other viruses and bacteria and parasites, they can come through. So toxoplasma is also one of them that if the food is not cooked properly, the, 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 the toxoplasma uh, radioids, they can transmit through meat also. Also, if in many, in many countries, uh, the, the salad is also mixed with the meat. So they can also, these people can also have, but in countries like India, because it is a, as I said, soil uh, transmitted or the food one, we can say through soil, from the cat feces is go to soil, soil to water, water to humans. So if the, the salads, which are particularly the ground vegetables, if they are not cleaned properly, this can also come through uh, the, the salads or the ground vegetables. Now, if you see the uh, global prevalence of uh, human toxoplasmosis, almost all countries, they are having a toxoplasma problem. And it is reported that uh, if you see that uh, it is prevalent as high as 90% or 85% or up to 90, Guatemala, it is, it is having up to 94% uh, prevalence. On the other hand, in Iceland, it is only 11%. So it is the variability is too huge. In the hot environment, toxoplasma is more common. In cold climate, it is comparatively less common. Nevertheless, the eating habits, they are very, very important, so they make a lot of difference. Now, if you see in uh, India, India also, this the variability is too high. You know, from 8% to as high as uh, up to 88% in some of the residential school and in food handlers, and as such, in the population, uh, it is in pregnant women about 44%. But in what we saw, that in goat and sheep, butchers, it was as high as 70%. And recently what we did, that, you know, we, we tried to find out that in north, south, west, east, how toxoplasma prevalence differs. So if you see that in South India here and Eastern India, so South India, the maximum prevalence was in South India uh, and the minimum was Western India. So what uh, it means, that it means that this is prevalence. And here, if you see that the uh, Gujarat and Karnataka, for comparison, if you take from where most of the samples we received, so if you see the temperature and climatic conditions, here Gujarat is usually the minimum is 13, and here the minimum is 21. Here it is the minimum is almost same, but Karnataka is tropical and Gujarat is dry, arid. The temperature fall also precipitation is also different in two you know states so that explains that you know the prevalence in two extreme prevalence of the toxoplasma in south india and gujarat state because in gujarat if you see that most of the time it is you know, sandy arid and you know this remains dry on the other hand karnataka kerala and tamil nadu most of the year the, the it is hot and humid so the, the cysts of the toxoplasma, they survive better in this condition. So that is the reason. Now, the another aspect is other than food bond, the vector bond, that climatic changes also they can uh, affect. We have discussed it. Now, the question is that how we can, you know, mitigate it. Now, for that, obviously, we can have the reduced use of oil and coal uh, vehicles, uh, the, the energy. Uh, we should rely more on the uh, renewable energy. And then obviously we should see that how the uptake of CO2 uh, is uh, minimized. 
uh, so that generation is also less so that obviously for uh, trees are more uh, you know deforestation is minimized and uh, the 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 plants or trees they are not uh, you know uh, uh, they do not banish from the, our environment and then obviously the uh, renewable uh, the energy sources they should be used the one thing is also possible that you know we adapt to our uh, climatic conditions and the uh, we should also manage our ecosystem which is very very important as i said from very beginning that our ecosystem is making lot of difference so it could be forest it could be marine it could be various other reserves also so therefore we need to be uh, environment friendly and we should be careful and caring for the environment so that is that is very very important important i think and i i think this is uh, this will make lot of difference that our teachers uh, and the those who can make difference in the senior positions we should teach our colleagues and our juniors that how to take care and how to really preserve our ecosystem our environment and how to be uh, careful that many of the diseases they can get transmitted through uh, meat if this is not cooked properly and how the exotic foods or exotic animals we should avoid eating so that is i think a take home message and i think with that i would like to thank you very much over to you for questions if you have any thank you very much sir for your uh, wonderful uh, informative session now the uh, session is open for discussion uh, sir can you withdraw your uh, ppt yes. stop sharing uh, now i invite dr uh, viju s Uh, co-chair of this particular session to comment on this particular uh, thank you sir uh, good evening everybody uh, first of all uh, i congratulate all the authorities of uh, kerala veterinary and animal science university and uh, indian veterinary association covas manuthi unit and meat technology unit and ants for the conduct of this webinar on this world zoonosis day 2020 also i would like to express my heartfelt gratitude uh, towards my teacher uh, maya ma uh, professor and head of the anatomy department uh, for inviting me to be a part of this webinar so we all know what's the importance of zoonosis <clears throat> in the better public health especially in this current scenario uh, in the covid pandemic the novel corona virus pandemic is shaken all over the world as professor selman said earlier in his presentation any ecological or environmental changes or climatic changes <coughs> will directly influence the uh, emergence of zoonotic diseases whether it is natural or uh, by the intervention intervention of human beings by uh, uh, globalization it will changes any changes in this will change the equilibrium of the a uh, environment and when this equilibrium is changed some pathogens may uh, cross the species barrier and may may cause uh, mutation and may cause human infection so it's time to focus sharply on the zoonotic disease that has spread by animals which are forced to move out of their natural habitat which is being destroyed increasingly uh, in our days So in this context, it was an excellent topic, excellent topic, and so much information was covered. And, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Salman Singh. If there is any question, I would be more than happy. But because you know some of the uh, slides, I just you know didn't mention much. But uh, definitely, if anybody has any questions, I would be more than happy. but uh, thank you once again uh, if there is no question thank you very much yeah. uh, i don't know whether you know because i was not told that how much time i have to cover so that's what i i finished in 20 25 minutes little 5 minutes little later because 
I think it was 30 minutes, so I, I you know, overshoot uh, five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Devda, madam, uh, uh, former uh, Director of Academic and Research of Kerala Veterinary Animal Science University and current professor and head of uh, Parasitology Department. Madam. Can you hear me? Ah, yes, yes, madam. Uh, sir, good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, good evening, madam. Okay, uh, sir, just uh, one question. Please. Uh, uh, how, what is the current status of Leishman users in India among human beings? Yeah, it has it has decreased a lot because you know the government of India is running very successful Kalajar uh, elimination program. So the now deaths are very rare, but yes, in two thousand of cases, about two thousand to two thousand nine hundred cases, they were reported last year. But there is hardly any death uh, these days because otherwise it used to kill thousands of people, in particularly in uh, uh, Bihar. West Bengal, Assam, and uh, Eastern Uttar Pradesh. So cases are still there. They are infrequent, of course, because government has started many uh, incentives, including the free medicine, free diagnosis, and also they are giving 2,000 rupees to 5,000 rupees in the form of travel allowance and motivation allowances. So this is making a lot of difference. And I, I think very soon it might get eliminated, but still, in West Bengal and uh, sorry, in West Bengal, yes, and Bihar, few cases are still there. Okay, uh, now so one more uh, that is, uh, uh, we are really glad to have listened to your uh, thought-provoking uh, speech, and I, actually, I'm very thankful to you, sir. In spite of your busy schedule, you uh, you were ready to come and give a lecture, and that too in the midst of COVID testing and sampling really awe inspiring uh, that is a, we should uh, it is a message which you gave uh, to safeguard our nature our planet and finally our survival uh, now another thing for the information of uh, everyone dr sarman singh actually he has been maintaining the toxoplasma culture in mice for the past uh, half a century years. 31 31 years, 31 years. 31 years. Sir. So he himself has been maintaining the culture of Toxoplasma gondii in mice for the past 31 years. That's a tedious one. Once you have uh, done this work of culturing Toxoplasma gondii, you'll know how tedious it is. And he has been doing that for the past 31 years. That's a great achievement. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for coming and uh, participating in our webinar. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all once again. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rishad. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Any more question? You can unmute and ask it. Yeah, I'm Dr. Srinivas uh, asking a question. Yes, please. Uh, what is the comparative severity of the, all the genetic diseases that you have told, sir? Which one is the most severest and uh, are it, um, uh, problematic to the human beings? You know, all, all are, you know, this is a very long list, severity, because like right now, we all know COVID is also one of the, you can say that uh, basically it is also genotic, it comes in the category of genotic. So COVID is there, dengue is there, chikungunya, they are there. And then of course, if the, the hunter virus is there, there are several viruses which are mostly the RNA viruses, they are always most severe. But of course, other than that, you know, the, uh, the, uh, parasitic diseases, of course, in toxoplasma, say, for example, if you say in the pregnant lady or in AIDS patient, they are, it is more severe, and so is uh, leishmaniasis. So it depends on the what, you know, uh, uh, situation we are talking of. But definitely many of the viruses depends on the, like hepatitis E, that is also genotic waterborne disease. Genotic and waterborne disease. So that is also if it occurs in uh, uh, pregnant lady, Obviously, the fatality is very, very high. So I can enumerate, you know, number of the uh, infections, which depends on the whether they are in pregnant women, they are in the immunocompromised, if they are in the uh, the the uh, HIV patients, 
or in pediatric age group or old age group. So it it will depend accordingly. But definitely some of the examples I narrated, like hepatitis E, like you know the hantavirus, like Kisanur forest disease, like MERS, like SARS, like Corona SARS. So all these uh, infections they are really very very serious. So we, we we should consider that all infections can be serious. So uh, it is difficult to say that which is not serious. Yeah. Hello. So I, I don't know whether there was some question or what. I don't know. Hello. I can't understand the no words. What do you mean, sir? Something else. Sir. So if if no questions, uh, then thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, this man, yes, he sent object plasmosis in uh, other. Uh... Okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead, ask. Yeah. Kindly introduce uh, yourself and ask question. Hello. Yes, please. Yes, please. I can hear yes, you. Yes, you don't want to see me here. Yeah. All yes. right. Yes, uh, is the availability of a genotic uh, division in your institute, sir? Uh, and in which aspects it is, uh, it is working, sir, other than dysmaniasis and uh, toxoplasmosis? In, uh, uh, in which pathogen it is now uh, working, sir, there? And uh, what is the availability of, sir, uh, in there, there, sir? Mm, sorry, uh, right now we don't have, you know, genotic division, uh, uh, only clinical microbiology department is there, so they, they take care of, uh, but uh, basically in, um, not audible, you know, uh, audible only, audible. Know what. Audible. so uh, uh, let me tell you very frankly that, you know, uh, Dr. Anandan and Dr. Devedan, they know that in medical institutes, it is not a trendy thing. Uh, uh, I am, uh, you know, a rare variety which developed uh, interest and I am still maintaining about more than 30 years. Uh, but uh, veterinary science in medical science, usually they don't, you know, they, they, they are least interested. It is a bitter uh, truth, but it is a fact. So uh, uh, not many medical institutes, you will find that people are there. But yes, of course, many of the institutes, they look forward for the collaboration. And that is the reason at Ames Delhi, when I was in Ames Delhi till, uh, you know, 30 years from 2000, uh, uh, 1998 to 2018, we developed uh, interest in toxoplasma and leishmaniasis. So I, I can't call myself that, you know, I developed the whole genotic division, but of course, some of the two, uh, two pathogens, because it is a huge discipline. And to handle the whole, you know, uh, clinical microbiology and genotic things, and also, you might be knowing that in medical colleges, the microbiologists are so, not so many. So there are maximum about 10 faculty members, and it is sometimes it is very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to develop a genotic division. But of course, NCDC is a central institute. I am not sure that whether you know or not. National Center for Communicable Disease in Delhi, they deal with, and uh, some universities they have but not many medical institutes, they have this division. But toxoplasma, if anybody is interested, uh, they, 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 it is, you know, we can provide toxoplasma, but of course you have to have your animal ethics committee from your institute. That is a prerequisite. Many times, many people, they ask, yes, but you know, they don't have to ask. So animal ethics so, committee, animal ethics committee. committee. Yes, you have I couldn't understand I what you said. I couldn't understand what you said. It is equine. It is equine. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you very much, sir, for your Thank you very much, sir, for your Okay. 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 Any more question? Thank you, Dr. Sa. Thank you very much. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Uh, now I invite Dr. S. Maya, uh, okay, Director of Academic Staff College, to close this particular session. Respected sir, today we are very much honored and happy to have you here to discuss on the disturbances to nature on uh, zoonotic diseases. Um, e Technology Unit of Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University and Indian Veterinary Association, Veterinary College Unit. The Association of Meat Scientists and Technologists are, are very much grateful to you for accepting our invitation and for enlightening us on the various factors and features of nature leading to zoonotic diseases if left unattended. Uh, I also thank Dr. Biju S. Chair and Veterinary Doctor, Veterinary Quarantine Ministry of Climate Change and Environment from UAE uh, for co-chairing the session. Thank you, sir for the wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you.